Hello and welcome to today's special presentation by Healthy Connections, how to encourage academic, social, and emotional engagement of school-age children and teens, a survival guide. Today's keynote presenters are Conra Lucas Adkins and Sandra Sobel of Marshall University. Please note that we are recording today's presentation and we'll make it available as soon as we can on Healthy Connections YouTube channel. Be looking for that link because we'll send it to you. You can submit your questions for our keynote presenters at any time during today's presentation simply by using the Q&A box in your WebEx player. If you're not familiar with the Q&A box, we'll show you where it is a little later in today's presentation. In addition to Conra and Sandra, we also will be hearing from Misty Dyke, who is our producer for today and will facilitate our Q&A portion of today's presentation. I'm Shane and Wright, the Director of Innovation for Quality Insights. Are you familiar with Healthy Connections? If not, we are a Huntington, West Virginia-based coalition that helps pregnant women, mothers, and their families navigate treatment and support services available in the community. Healthy Connections consists of more than 30 Huntington area agencies and organizations working together with the shared mission of helping people affected by substance use disorder. Quality Insights is a key member of Healthy Connections and is also one of the largest nonprofit organizations devoted to improving healthcare quality. Quality Insights uses data and community solutions to achieve the goals of better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. Our 300 plus employees and consultants with experience in healthcare delivery, continuous quality improvement, medical record abstraction, data analysis, information, social technology, social marketing, and more share the mission of bringing people and information together to improve health. Specific to Healthy Connections, Quality Insights contributes in-kind services related to marketing, branding, web infrastructure development, partnership coordination, resource creation, earned media, advertising, and webinar production like the session that you are on today. Our two keynote presenters, first of all, are Conra Lucas Adkins, who is an assistant professor with Marshall University's Department of School Psychology in the College of Education and Professional Development. She currently serves as the West Virginia Delegate to the National Association of School Psychologists and is a member of the Cross-State Collaborative to Support Schools in the Opioid Crisis. Our second keynote presenter we'll be hearing from today is Sandra Stobel. She is an assistant dean for the College of Education and Professional Development at Marshall University. She teaches in the school psychology program as well. She's a licensed psychologist and school psychologist as well. She provides counseling services at Bible Center Church, and her research interest is in mental health of children and adolescents. With that, it is my great pleasure to turn over today's presentation to Sandra. Sandra? Thank you. Thanks so much for this opportunity to speak with all of you about how to encourage academic, social, and emotional engagement with school-aged children and teenagers. It is a difficult time for many of us as we're trying to figure out how to balance work and home um, issues as our children are there at home with us and we're trying to support them. As I'm talking, please keep in mind that there's no one size that fits everyone. You'll need to adapt this to your current situation. We all have different family compositions and different jobs, so you'll need to figure out what works for you. Some of us have supportive spouses. Well, some of us are single parents. Some of us are working as much as ever. Some are now unemployed. Some of us have flexible work schedules and others do not. You need to take away from this talk what will work for your situation. Also, you may need to gradually implement some of these ideas. You may not be able to say, tomorrow we're doing something totally different without having a rebellion on your hands. 
And above all, be kind to yourself. If you're having a bad day, declare a school holiday and make cupcakes together. Or say it's going to be a school field trip and take a walk outside to identify trees and plants in your neighborhoods, or you're going to go for a drive in the country. You need to think about what works for your family and for you. I want to start off by talking about you thinking about yourself and keeping yourself healthy. Because before you can get your children to engage academically, emotionally, or socially with you or with each other, you need to be thinking about the kind of modeling that you're doing. You can't care for others unless you first take care of yourself. Children take their cues from you. It's stressful for kids to continue to hear that you're so tired or so stressed. They may start to think it's their fault. How you're coping will affect them. So be sure to practice coping skills. And you need to figure out what are the best coping skills for you. How are you able to reduce your stress? We found that deep breathing is really a valuable tool for calming the nervous system. Breathing has been found to change us from that sympathetic nervous system, which is ready to fight or flight. It makes us tense and anxious. That breathing helps reset our system into that parasympathetic state where we can feel calm and relaxed. It's important to breathe with our children too, teach them how to do breathing. Some of us, physical exertion calms us down. Maybe it's cleaning out your cupboards, vacuuming, yoga, an online workout, videos, running the stairs. Or maybe we're best with soothing methods, taking a bubble bath, taking extra time in the shower with that good smelling soap, doing a face mask, just taking some time to drink our special coffee or tea. For other of us, it's connecting with others, you know, texting our friends, FaceTime with family and friends, Zoom happy hours with coworkers. But I want you to remember that if you need to vent, do it in a way that your children don't hear. Be sure you're in a space where they're not overhearing all that you're saying about your worries and concerns and frustrations, because children absorb all of that. And maybe you need to email or text those thoughts, or maybe you just need to journal them in order to be able to say them up safely, but still get them out. We are the, our children's safe place. We need not to be overly emotional when talking with them. But of course, sometimes we'll mess up and make mistakes, and that's okay too, because then we can model saying, hey, you know, I was really stressed, I got upset, and then this is what I did to calm down, or I'm sorry that I lost my temper. Some of you may find that you're able to cope by engaging in some activities that you enjoy, such as reading, watching Netflix movies, taking a new course online for fun, Others of you maybe identify projects that will help you, that you could do for others. When we do for others, it makes us feel better about ourselves. That could be writing emails or letters to neighbors or others that are stuck at home alone, or sending it to healthcare workers, sending positive messages over social media, reading a favorite children's book on a social media platform. So I wanna say all that to say, don't feel guilty about taking some time for yourself. It's really important to do that self-care. And if you have just seconds, maybe it's as simple as turning off your phone, putting on some special perfume, congratulating yourself on one thing you got done that day. If you have minutes, maybe you have time to burn a candle, drink that cup of tea, take 10 deep breaths, have a meditation or prayer, put on some music and dance, or write down five things you're thankful for. If you have hours, then you have time to watch your favorite movie again, read a good book, take a nap, do some yoga, an even longer time, then maybe you can try a new hobby or restart a new one, try something new. I want to talk about attitude too. And I know in the stressful time with our kids there, maybe our spouse is there, that it can be very stressful. And with feeling overwhelmed with working and helping them with school and juggling everything, that we can feel pretty stressed. And so we have to really focus on our attitude. We have to think about focusing on the positive. Sure, this is a time that's different from others, but let's think about making this time memorable in a positive way. Let's do some things we don't usually have time for. Let's do some activities with our family, some family projects. Maybe we can even get our spouses to do those honeydew lists and rejoice in that. You know, take time to do some special things and think about, wow, this is great. I can do these now. 
And maybe it's even just teaching your children how to do laundry before they go off to college. Now you have time to do it before you hated to ask them to do all these chores because they had all this schoolwork and then they had sports they were involved in. Now you have time to do some different things and try to stay calm. You know, there, as I said, there'll be times you may lose your temper and kind of be over the edge, step back, figure out how to cope and then come back out and talk about it. And we really need to limit our media watching. Just because news is on 24 hours, it doesn't mean we have to watch it for 24 hours. It means it's there whenever we have the time to watch it. And if we're constantly filling our minds with, oh no, this, this, this many people have passed away, oh, more cases here, more cases there, it just causes a lot of angst and anxiety in our hearts. We need to be informed so we can provide our children with factual information, but we sure don't want to overwhelm ourselves. And then we want to be that model. You can be honest about your feelings, as I said. Mommy's feeling worried, daddy's feeling worried, so I'm going to go take a break and read my book for a few minutes. Or I'm going to go run on the treadmill. Or I'm going to go drink my favorite drink while looking at this magazine. And we need to practice that good daily hygiene. I know some of us were tempted, like, oh, we're at home all the time. We are just going to stay in our pajamas all day, not shower, don't put any makeup on or deodorant. But, you know, when you look like a slob, you feel like a slob, it just brings your whole mood down. It's better to say, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get ready for my day. Even if I'm not leaving the house, I'm going to get ready and look good for those people around me. I'm going to get showered. I'm going to get dressed. Um, and then that's modeling that, that you want your children to do that too. And then we also want to model all of those important steps that that we're asking us to do, like staying home, washing our hands, keeping our hands from our faces, cleaning well. And we want to let kids know that there is some control. There's so many things that are out of control, but we need to focus on what we can control. And that has that calming effect on our children. So when they say, when will I get to see my friends again? When will we get to get out of this house again? We can honestly say, we're not sure. Here's some suggested dates, but we don't know. And then we can say, but let's focus on what we can do. We are going to keep doing all that we're doing because that's getting us closer to our goal of ending this stay at home. And that is that social distancing, that washing our hands, not touching our face. And we can focus on what we can control, like what we're having for dinner tonight. Oh, yay, pizza. Let's think about that. And then we have to really model that, you know, good habits of building our immune system. You know, this is a time where all of us should be able to get enough sleep, you know, try to work hard at eating that balanced diet, making sure we exercise. All of that is really, really important. The other thing that's important about balancing this work and school that many of us are, are trying to figure out is to have a schedule. And I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by that idea. That just means keeping a regular routine so that children feel that comfort, that structure. They know what's going to happen that day. And it's really recommended that you first hold a family meeting and you get their input, especially the older the children are, the more important that input is to say, hey, we need to have a daily schedule. What, what do you think needs to be in it? And definitely you need to give some input in what needs to be in it. But you need to get their input too and get their preferences and build that in. We all know that when we include others in decision making, we get more cooperation. And so it's also helpful to have it visual for kids so that they can see it. That consistency helps them focus. And we have to remember that, you know, we are not gonna recreate that seven hour school day. We're not gonna even try. And in one of my later slides, you'll see the recommended attention times for younger children to older children and see that maybe you're asking them to spend too much time at that kitchen table doing that work. And as homeschoolers have been telling us for years, you can get a lot more accomplished in a short amount of time when you individualize things. So you hold that family meeting, you be mindful of the work that your children have to do, your work requirements. You may need to think, oh, maybe I need to get up early in the morning because I need a block of time to work. I'm going to work from 7 to 10. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and then I'm not going to get my children up till 10 because then they're going to do their work. Maybe that works for you. Or maybe you get all up together, get dressed, showered, have breakfast, have a nice conversation, and then you all go to your workstations. And it is helpful for everybody to have a dedicated workspace. And your work is flexible enough that you can get your children started, then get back to your work. You have to figure out what works for you. And that's why that feedback. And then you have to know your own kids. Do they need a lot of support or don't they? Can the older children help the younger some? You have to figure all that out. But remember to be flexible. As I said, you may just have to say, this is a bad day. Let's have a school holiday. Let's watch, you know, our favorite TV show for a few hours to kind of reset, calm everybody down, get to a better place, and not be hard on yourself. Practice that self-compassion, knowing that you are doing the best you can and that you have a lot placed on your shoulders. When you think about that uh, dedicated space, you know it can be at the kitchen table, on their bed, in a comfy chair in the living room, and they may even want them to rotate different places. You may need to think about when one has a noisy activity that the others are having that same kind of noisy activity, so one's not trying to cop cooperate, you know, concentrate while the other isn't. So you need to figure that all out. And when I said about that schedule, it can be detailed or broad. I'll show you a, a more detailed one and then a broader one. And it's helpful to have some things stay the same, such as a set meal time. So maybe we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same time every day, but other things rotate. Or we always have academics in the morning, but which academic can vary by day? Some schools will dictate what your child needs to do, but others won't. Some have more requirements than others, you have to figure that out. But children need to know what's going to happen. Again, it makes life predictable. There's comfort with structure and routine. And even within your schedule, you can give choices. You know, you can say you have to do academics in the morning and it could be math or science. And then you can have them do a chore for you because we know that life skills are a learning experience. So they could fold vac, fold, excuse me, fold laundry or vacuum. And in that schedule, don't forget exercise because we know at school that they have those times where you get to go to recess or PE or there's different breaks where they get to move around and your children will need to move around. Having different choices each day can make it interesting. And so you can make a list and then have the children choose from that and helping to come up with that schedule. And so in your family, you might make it for the day, you might make it for the week, um, figure out what works. And remember that even school-based lessons rarely go perfectly, even for professional teachers. Kids struggle with instructions. They get frustrated no matter how well we prepare. And teachers often spend time thinking about how to improve their next lesson. And as you as a parent stepping into these teaching roles, it's crucial to think, oh, there's going to be some missteps. There's going to be some problems, but I'm going to think about them as learning opportunities. I'm going to keep that positive attitude. I'll do better tomorrow. We're going to learn from this. I'm going to get feedback from my kids. But make sure the voice in your head is kind. You know, practice that self-compassion. Hey, I'm okay. I'm getting better. I'm learning something new. This is all right. And think of this as a time to really focus on your child's weaknesses and their passions. Think about a time where if your child's struggling with reading, maybe you can build in some extra reading time and then focus on their passions. If they love cooking, you know, have cooking lessons every day and talk about math. Say, let's double this recipe and we'll learn about fractions. If they love drawing, include more drawing in their assignments. You know, draw the solar system. So making sure that you make it interesting to them. And some people have found that it's good every day to wake up and have a goal. My goal is that every child in this house will do some writing today. So maybe everything else didn't go according to plan, but everybody did some writing, and so we feel good about it. So how do we get those children to academically engage? We know we have some that are more studious than others, some that are more cooperative than others, some it can be more challenging. Some are self-starters. They sit down, get their work done, while others need lots of <laughs> reminders. So setting those realistic goals. 
And that's why in that additional slide that's coming where it talks about how long we can expect them to sit and work makes sense. Making sure you have eye contact and you have them restate what they're supposed to be doing if attention is an issue. You can't just say, go do this and that, 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 you know, and give a multi-step direction and expect them to retain it all and have heard you, especially if they're very distractible. Just make sure they're looking at you as you give it to them. And again, having some hands-on learning. Make the learning fun. Don't make it all worksheets or answering things on the computer. Make sure they have some non-screen non time, some things that they do, like setting up a science experiment. You know, maybe if they love Legos, doing some math problems with Legos, giving them math problems and they have to create the Legos to match the math problems. So being creative with that. And then balancing that work of play again, like we talked about, that there's some fun things to look forward to later on in the day. They know it's not all work. Grandma's rule is, you know, first you eat your vegetables, then you get your dessert, same kind of thing. First you do this work, then you can have a break, and in your break, you maybe can do whatever you want for 20 minutes, or perhaps you could do this really fun activity I know you like. So another thing to do is think about using a timer. And a timer can be useful. I'll give you three ideas for using the timer. One idea is if you have a child that's competitive, that you can say, I'm going to set this timer and you see if you can finish this work before this timer goes off. And the secret there is that you set the timer so that there is enough time for that child to get the work done. And so that for sure then it gets the reward, it gets the prize, and, you're, and you can rejoice in it and say, see how great you are? But you have to make sure you do this with a child who can handle competition, competition well. And the second way to use the timer is say, hey, Here's some work you have to do. When the timer goes off, you are done. It doesn't matter if the work is finished. If the timer goes off, you're done. And this can be particularly helpful if you have a child that has this long page of long division problems you have to do. And he looks at it and he just says, he gives up before he even starts. There's no way I can do all that work. And you say, you know, here's a timer. Again, you may know that your child can do it, but you say to him that you the timer only works that way if you stay engaged the whole time. You do your very best. And so if you look over and see them dawdling, you have to remember, remember we're on the timer, and this helps them get focused and stay working. And then what happens if the timer does go off before they're done? Well, you honor that commitment. You close that book and say, hey, we're done for today. A third way to use the timers with older teens Let's say they have a whole page of all this work they have to do. They're feeling overwhelmed too. And you say to them, go ahead and put a time, how long you think it'll take you to do each of those. And then I want you to use a timer and evaluate it. How long did it take you? And it, it gives them a little incentive there to try to get done sooner. And so they can then compare their estimated time with their actual time. And, you know, this is really a good skill to teach them anyway with time management. So it's a, it's a good thing for them to learn. Incentives are always good. <laughs> for some of our children, they need some incentives to keep working. And we often say to parents, I mean, you wouldn't work if you didn't get a paycheck, right? So sometimes we need to remember that for our kids and say, hey, you know, here, um, you get this special treat right after you're done with your work or you get your free time like I've talked about before. It's that balance, work and play. Also making sure you, you have breaks in your schedule. You're not expecting them to go, 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 go. And of course, making it fun. A hands-on learning and making it fun kind of go hand in hand because when we can get up and do things, that makes it more interesting, thinking about their passions and their hobbies and then allowing choices. And I already talked about that some. Kids are more cooperative when we get to say, hey, you know, would you want to do this or that? You get to pick, but you have to do something. And then finally, I left off praise because praise is really important. We have to remember to praise our children. And that ratio should be five to one, praising them five times for every criticism or complaint. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, that dynamic when I talk about emotional connection, but what we want to see more of, we praise. We want to see more in-seat work, praising when they're sitting there, praising them when they're working hard, praising them when they're finishing their work. 
is really important. And it's probably good to wait for electronics till the afternoon if you can, but not everybody's able to do that. So here is um, the recommendation for the West Virginia Department of Education about student engagement timeline consideration. And so when you look at some of those, you say, wow, you know, they're not expecting them to attend for very long at all or stay on task that long at all. And so we need to be thinking about that as we are building our schedule, as we're working to figure out what they should do. Here's a sample of that elementary schedule showing that, you know, getting up, having breakfast, you know, getting the materials together, giving them you know, time to do the different subjects. And it can be that you change it and you can say Monday's math day, Tuesday's science day, Wednesday's social studies day. And if you have control over it, like some of us don't have control over it because our school says, okay, this has to be done this day. But you see how there's variety, there's outside time, there's fun things to do. And then even thinking about when dinner would be, when they have time just to do whatever they want. And when we want them to do that physical activity, I know there's a lot of resources out there. I've heard some parents say, we feel overwhelmed with all of the resources. There are so many. And you have to figure out what works for you. If you're feeling overwhelmed with all of the things that are coming at you with you, emails, just, you know, save some of those for later. Just do what you can do. But there is Cosmic Kids Yoga for phys physical activity. They have free and entertaining yoga and Go Noodle has short videos just to get your kids moving. Let's say you're going from one activity to another and you get out there. Kids Bop YouTube channel has dance along videos. So there's really fun things that you can do to help them get up and move before they have to concentrate again. And then here's a simpler schedule. Maybe your family just needs that simpler one. You don't need the detailed one. You have to figure out again what works for you. So here's where you get up. You know, maybe you can have some exercise in the morning, academics, and creative time, and chore time, and quiet time, and some more academics. Dr. Lucas is going to talk about this slide. Thank you, Sandra. Um, as you were talking about scheduling, um, it came to mind um, some additional resources um, and ideas for scheduling. And definitely, I don't want to overwhelm anybody. Um, but as Sandra talked about, um, our State Departments of Education and West Virginia in, in particular, um, they've issued guidance documents for remote learning. Um, and I will talk more about West Virginia's resources later, uh, but I just definitely wanted to um, put that at the forefront. And Sandra shared with you a couple of schedules um, that are available in that guidance document. Um, and additionally, as Sandra had pointed out, sometimes the schools are dictating um, the schedules to an extent. Uh, for instance, they may have blocks of time where students can connect with teachers um, through virtual platforms. So it's important to um, take a look at your school's website um, or your local um, school district or the Department of Ed. Um, number two, I think, just as Sandra had talked about, being realistic with your schedule is um, crucial. Um, you know, not setting yourself and your family up for failure. Um, realizing that modifications are expected and flexibility is going to be required. I can speak personally, um, being the mom of two adolescents, um, I have had to um, relax my restrictions on uh, virtual uh, devices. Um, you know, my son is 12, and so he is getting more time on his Xbox Live because I know he is talking with two of his friends from school during that time. So um, he's playing the Xbox in the living room. You know, I can walk in and out. I hear the conversation. But he does get more time now than during traditional um, school schedule days. Um, another personal example with my children is they are sleeping a lot later than normally. And they're staying up later. So, um, you know, I am permitting this um, because, you know, they are um, getting those school assignments done in the evening. Um, and as a mom who's trying to work from home with my job, uh, fortunately, I'm um, able to arrange a lot of my um, time that I need at my computer, quiet time in the mornings and the early afternoons so that I can focus on what they need in the later afternoons and evenings. 
Um, lastly, but definitely not of least importance, is again something that Sandra had talked about. Um, and I think this works across all age groups. Um, scheduling, you know, work sessions first and then rewarding yourself, you know, rewarding your children with um, opportunities to do something that they want to do. And um, there's a website that I found a lot of this information. Um, and so I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, it's childmind.org. So Sandra, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Lucas. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was how to encourage social engagement. So I've been talking about how to encourage academic engagement, but we want our children to engage with others and with us. We know sometimes that we don't get to spend much time with our, our children, especially as they get older, they're just all focused on their peers. So I want to, to talk about that a minute, about how to get them to be more engaged, not just be sitting in their rooms, because we're, we know they're at risk for mental health issues if they're just sitting in their bedrooms all the time by themselves. And so we need to figure out what our preference of our children are. We need to know what they want to do and not just always trying to impose things that we think are fun on them. But again, it's getting their feedback. We also need to teach negotiation skills because we know maybe there's only so many TVs in the home or so many <laughs> games to play and one wants to play this and one wants to play the other. Negotiation is a really important skill that will, our children will use the rest of their lives. And so it's healthy for us as families to sit down, talk about it, talk about, you know, how to figure out these conflicts and do it as a family. And we need to realize that just as we need to be connected with other people, they need to be connected too. So we want to allow them that time to connect. And maybe for some of our children, they really even miss some family members and thinking about a time how can we connect with them? Even with our younger children, it might be letting grandma and grandpa spend some time with the homework with them, reading, letting the child read the story to them, um, working on a worksheet together, talking it back and forth. Um, that can provide you support while you're trying to get your work done and also help keep that connection with grandparents and other loved ones in their lives that they haven't been able to see. And we need to make sure if we want that social engagement that we're doing fun things, that, you know, this is a time that we haven't been able to have for a long time when we're all together all at once. And so we need to think, maybe we can organize a tournament if there's different kind of activities in your house and you can all take turns. And you can have, do family card games, you can make board games, doing charades or chess, going to hike or walk, as long as it's, uh, you know, uh, you can do it safely in your neighborhood. Encouraging your children to journal about this time of COVID-19. Just trying to think about watching a TV show together and trying to predict what's going to happen. Or even at the end, um, pretending that you're film critics and you're all going to try to critique it. Again, I want to talk about that praise. You know, sometimes our children are testing boundaries and, you know, we're frustrated and so we're always telling them, clean your room, you know, do your work, you're wearing too much makeup. We're always telling them what's wrong. And so we have to step back and think we really are supposed to say five positive things to our children for every one negative. And so if we're getting into that habit of just being really, really negative with them, we need to be thinking about what, what do we see positive? Maybe they jumped in and helped a younger child. Maybe they had a creative thought that was really useful. Maybe they had a great idea for the schedule. Just making sure that we're pointing that out and letting them know. Maybe they did a great job on their work. And so we want to make sure that we use that praise. And here are just some ideas I had, additional ideas about, you know, having fun with a movie night, backyard games, filming a family talent show, having a scavenger hunt. Um, my daughter had a friend and she has some children that she took and the toilet paper rolls and glued them together to make like binoculars <laughs> and then hid things around the house and the yard. And for the older kids wrote clues for the younger kids just had pictures of what they needed to be looking for. And they had a great time. Or maybe you're having a cooking contest. Everybody takes a turn cooking a dessert each night or a, a dinner each night. And then you have critiques 
and make sure that there's kindness in the Kachiks, though. Growing a garden, we know we people are talking about growing those victory gardens, just like in the time of war where uh, people were worried about having enough food, and so they were encouraged to grow gardens. Now that are concerned about going to grocery stores, we can teach children about gardening. And then there's just, as I said, so many resources that if you're sad that you can't get out of the house and go places, you miss vacation time, you know, there are sites here like visiting the Louvre in Paris, exploring the San Diego Zoo, walking the Great Wall of China, experiencing the big wave surfing in Maui, traveling 352 million miles to Mars. And all of these things are educational as well as, you know, a time to um, have fun with your children. So I'm going to be turning it over to uh, Dr. Lucas, but I do want to say that you know, it would be really helpful if your family would establish a practice of gratitude. And each night at dinner, if they would just all say something that good that happened that day, something they're thankful for, if we can focus on that positive. And when they're doing their academics, if they're feeling frustrated, that you really validate them. You don't brush it off like, oh, you know, just do that work. You listen to them and try to say, oh, I know it is hard. Let's do it later when I have more time to give you some attention. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Lucas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Strobel. Um, definitely that was some um, wonderful, um, those were wonderful ideas and things that we need to keep in mind. Um, as I was putting together um, the content of my section of the presentation, um, the phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, um, came to my mind. So I really believe that Charles Dickens said that uh, best. Um, and specifically, I'm applying that to um, these times of being at home and um, social distancing um, and how our teenagers and our older kids are, um, you know, handling these moments. So, you know, on one hand, it's the best of times because we're at home as parents with our children. Um, it's a great opportunity to connect with them, uh, really get to know them, have conversations with them. Um, but at the same time, these circumstances, you know, being at home, being limited in um, your social contacts can greatly increase the likelihood of conflict and stress um, in our homes. So some tips for, um, you know, good communication with our older kids and our teenagers during all times, you know, during the best of times and the worst of times, include things like listening, um, active listening, uh, being aware of what you say as a parent and how you say it, the body language. Um, asking teens and older kids for their understanding of what you said, um, especially when you notice that they're getting upset. Um, perhaps the problem is that they have misunderstood what you're trying to communicate to them. taking me a minute to switch my slide. I can jump in there for you, Conra. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, with this slide, some um, tips for keeping that communication um, healthy during the best of times. Um, I really like the idea of seeking first to understand and then to be understood. I think this applies with um, us as parents of adolescents, trying to understand the perspective um, of our older child, our teenager, um, allowing them time to present their um, side of the story. You know, what's their rationale? Um, and then as uh, Dr. Strobel was emphasizing, um, as parents and adults, um, for us to keep calm and uh, recognize when we may need a break from that conversation um, and offering that same uh, respect to our children. You know, there are times that they may need to take a break. And so we need to allow those breaks to be taken. Um, and then ultimately, I think um, realizing that winning an argument is not always the goal of communication.
So again, um, the phrase, the best of times and the worst of times, um, there were some key things that jumped out at me um, as I was gathering uh, materials for this presentation that I thought applied to um, the worst of times. And certainly now most of us consider this to be one of the worst times. Um, you know, first and foremost, acknowledging the stressors of our older kids and teens. Um, the stressors for them may be different from what we as adults um, are experiencing. For instance, um, you know, our, our adolescents are uh, being required to spend less time with their peers um, and increased physical proximity to us as their parents or to their siblings. And, you know, we know that this is not typical um, or natural for adolescents to want to spend their time um, at home with us. Um, you know, they're experiencing um, the postponement or cancellation of many major life events for them. For example, proms, graduation ceremonies, um, parties with their friends, dates, um, sporting events and competitions, and uh, validating the feelings um, that, our, that our kids have as a result of these um, stressors in their lives. Anger, disappointment, um, grief and loss, uh, frustration, anxiety. Um, and another stressor I, I wanted to point out too for our, our kids, um, the uncertainty about what the future holds for them. Um, for example, you know, will they be going back to school um, this year? And if so, what's that going to be like? Um, taking a look at next fall, you know, fall of 2021, what, what is that going to be like when they go to school? Um, what about our kids who are planning um, to go away to college for the fall? You know, what's their college experience going to be like that first semester? And for our kids who are um, seeking employment, um, you know, are there going to be those opportunities for employment in the summer and the fall? Um, so I think those are some things uh, for us, you know, to definitely keep in mind and again, validating the feelings that our kids are having as a result of those experiences. Um, helping our teens and our older kids to accept reality and recognizing what can't be changed. You know, what's in, within our control and then the things that are not within our control. And I think Dr. Strobel did a great job um, talking about this. Um, so what I like to emphasize um, are the three R's and I came across this, and so I, I just really connected um, with this message. So we are trying to help our teens accept reality and what can't be changed while implementing the three R's. And so the three R's would be refra reframing, refocusing, and reinforcing. And so refra reframing um, refers to um, helping to reframe some of those unrealistic notions or ideas um, that they may have. Uh, refocusing. Um, to the extent that we can uh, refocus uh, from what is wrong or what's missing uh, towards ways that we can creatively problem solve. And then finally, reinforcing. Um, it's important to reinforce individual strengths um, that our kids have and recognizing and reinforcing their capacity for resilience. So um, specific to um, our current circumstances with COVID-19, I think it's important for us to be honest in our communication as well as being mindful of the language that we use. And, um, you know, Dr. Strobel had pointed um, these things out. Um, I think that we need to be factual while being uh, developmentally appropriate in the use of our language. Uh, we want to be reassuring um, to the extent that our reassurance is reality-based. Um, we certainly don't want to be dishonest. Um, and then, you know, dealing with our own anxieties and our own uncertainties and not letting those negatively impact our children. And again, this is a wonderful um, website that I have uh, posted for you, childmind.org. Um, and so I would encourage you to take a look at that. So with this slide, what I wanted to do was just emphasize again the importance of our choice in words and language and how that, those choices can impact our kids. Um, so 
so oftentimes we use the terms stress and anxiety interchangeably. And to an extent, they can be interchangeable. Um, but I think of stress as being something that we um, regularly encounter. And in some instances, stress can uh, promote productivity. Um, you know, there are positive stressors, you know, things like celebrations and um, graduations, uh, becoming a parent, um, getting married. Um, and then there are negative stressors, like when we experience the death of a loved one, unemployment, uh, decreased opportunities for social engagement. Anxiety um, is the result of prolonged um, negative stress and anxiety can impair our ability to carry out necessary and daily activities. So along those same lines, I think it's important that we not shame our children, you know, for the feelings that, that we're having. We may not fully understand the, um, the effect that um, not being able to see your friends is having or not being able to um, go to your prom when it was scheduled is having. So uh, we just need to be mindful of that and be respectful of their reactions and responses. And also, I think it's just crucial that we have um, access to professional help um, when we need it. Um, persons like school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, um, our medical professionals, and our local behavioral health care resources um, are just vital to us. And when I talk about the uh, resources from West Virginia Department of Ed, um, you'll be able to see um, that they have specific contact information for those various um, behavioral health care providers. So this slide um, just further illustrates some of the negative connotations that we may have with certain mental health disorders. Um, and given, given our um, current COVID-19 um, pandemic and the effects that it's having on um, our mental health, um, some potential diagnoses jumped out at me from this list, um, anxiety disorders and uh, depression. And I think it's important that we um, acknowledge that an anxiety disorder um, may be a result of what we're experiencing, but um, having the disorder is not the same as just feeling stressed or anxious about the current circumstances. Um, depression, you know, the disorder may also result, but at the same time, we have to remember that it's normal for us to experience bad days. It's normal for us to experience sadness um, regarding some of these situations that we are facing right now. So as I had mentioned earlier, and when Dr. Strobel was talking, um, consulting the state departments of education and your local school websites and the district's uh, websites for guidance is strongly encouraged. Um, I can talk specifically about West Virginia because that's my home state. Um, my children are students in West Virginia schools and my husband's a teacher. Um, so I'm you know, familiar with the guidance that they have received and the resources that are available on their school website as well as the State Department website. Um, this is a picture of a document that was prepared near the beginning of April for West Virginia teachers, school officials, and families. Um, it includes ideas for academic and social emotional engagement. Um, the next few slides are um, ideas and activities that are shared within that document. And so um, you can see that there's definitely some dedication to um, social emotional well being. Um, this particular um, page talks a lot about the importance of engaging in conversation with children and teens, and it provides some of those links to um, behavioral health care providers and to the Office of Special Education and Support Services, um, which houses our school counselors, school psychologists, and school social workers. Um, again, this slide um, is with regard to social emotional well being, and it's really geared towards our uh, professionals in the schools, um, giving some ideas for 
how um, our school psychs, our school counselors, our school social workers can connect with students uh, from a distance and how they can maintain some of those behavioral supports that were in place prior to um, school disruption. Um, the next couple slides um, talk about promoting um, learning across the content areas, such as math, reading language arts, science, and social studies. Um, the slide I'm showing to you uh, talks about science in particular, and these ideas um, involve technology, having access to technology. And there are a couple columns that I want to draw your attention to. Um, one is, you know, a column that tells you whether or not this is a free um, resource, which that's always important um, for, for us to know. And um, also whether or not these resources are able to be printed. And so, you know, as I mentioned, there, um, there's guidance for each content area, but there's also guidance for um, related arts and other subject areas. You know, here's an example from computer science and STEM. So additionally, um, I think it's important that we share resources with our parents and families um, that are able to be used without technology. And in this guidance document, um, there are a whole host of activities, again, across the content areas um, that give you ideas for what to do whenever you don't have access to um, technology. For example, I have um, the slide here that talks about some social studies activities. And then the next slide um, drew my attention because it's about um, a meteor shower that's upcoming um, around the middle of April. Um, and I wasn't aware of that, but it's something that, you know, as a family, you can have an opportunity to go out and take a look to see if a meteor, if you can cite a meteor. And, um, you know, lastly on this page is preparing dinner. And I know Dr. Sherwell talked about that. that that's a time for conversation. It's also a great time to uh, practice those math skills like measuring um, fractions, um, some reading practice, you know, have one of the, the children, you know, be in charge of reading um, the recipes. And then lastly, before um, I turn it back over to Dr. Strobel, um, something I ran across today that I thought was um, a, a pretty cool idea. Um, it's a way to connect with kids through music. And um, I got an email from um, a website, um, a, a list service that I'm on, and um, there's a playlist um, on Spotify, and it's found at hashtag mental health strong. And so it's a playlist of songs that um, would be great to generate conversation about, you know, what's happening right now and how we are a resilient um, country. Um, and I recognized some of these songs from my daughter's playlist and, you know, she's almost 16. And so I know there are some current um, songs there um, as well as some songs that I'm familiar with. So I just thought that was a um, another really neat way to connect with kids, you know, through music. So Dr. Strobel, I think the next slide um, is yours um, regarding a book. I just wanted to show people this book is available if you have elementary age children that you want to talk to them about what coronavirus is, something they could read together. And, um, the, the last resource there is the reference for that book, the link for it. And then there were just some other other things, other resources there too. Uh, did you want to talk anything about your references? Um, yes, I was trying to switch to the slide. There we go. Um, Sandra, or Sandra and I included all of our um, resources, and I know we don't want to overwhelm people with resources, but um, you know some of these may be of interest to you. Um, and so we um, put together um, a couple of slides with those um, references for you. So some are websites, some are um, journal articles. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think that uh, wraps up our um, discussion of content. So thank you all very much for um, your attention and we certainly hope that we have offered you some um, tips. Thank you so much. Great presentation. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to our producer, Misty Dyke, to facilitate today's Q&A portion. If you'd like to ask a question, use your WebEx player. Just hover over there and you'll see the three dots like there on your screen, and that will open up the Q&A. Misty, I'll toss it to you. Thanks, Shannon. Um, we do have a question here. Uh, the first one that's come in says, if my teenage child says he's fine about everything that's going on and doesn't seem to want to discuss it, should I just let it go or should I try to get him to talk about it? Uh, looks like everybody's on mute. Dr. Lucas, I'll let you go ahead and answer that one. I know you focus more on teens. And um, sure, one of the um, things that I believe, you know, it's important is to, you know, try to engage um, children in, you know, discussions, um, but also recognizing that they're really, they may be doing okay, and they may be handling things okay, um, but watching for other um, signs and symptoms that there could be um, a problem. So, you know, just paying attention to um, how they're eating, how they're sleeping, um, you know, are they talking with um, you or are they isolating themselves in their rooms? Um, so I think there are some things that, you know, we need to attend to that can give us an idea about what's happening um, in our kids' minds. Um, there are, I, I do know that um, Kanawha County Schools offers opportunities for kids to touch base with their school counselors. Um, I saw that on the news, um, and so I don't have the details about how that's possible, but I think as a parent of a child in a school, you know, being able to touch base and just talk things over with, um, you know, a mental health professional is a great idea, if that's possible. Uh, next question is, uh, what are suggestions for school-aged children with little to no access to the Internet? And I know you touched on some of those recommendations in your presentation, and we can flip back over to that if you'd like to reference a slide. Um, sure, and Dr. Strobel may want to talk about that too. Um, first of all, I'm not I'm not sure if accessing the um, resource document would be possible if um, you have limited access to um, the internet, but within the West Virginia uh, resource document, there are some pages that talk specifically about activities that involve no technology. Um, I know that some schools are um, scheduling opportunities for parents to actually come there and pick up uh, packets and resource materials, um, you know, activities and things that can be done at home without technology. But um, that's a wonderful um, concern, question to have. All right, and then um, the last question has come in a couple times. Uh, folks are asking if there, if, um, I'm sorry, if there's going to be a recording of this event available. And we will be posting that on the Healthy Connections website. I will put the link in the chat box for everybody. And you will also be getting an email at the end of the presentation that will have that link included in it also. All right, Shannon, I think that's all. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us for this special Healthy Connections webinar today. Uh, you'll be directed to a post-event uh, feedback form. Uh, please make sure and fill out that assessment so that we can uh, further perfect our future offerings here at Healthy Connections. Uh, contact information for Conra, Sandra, and myself is on your screen right now. If you would like to reach out to any of us at any time, uh, maybe with a question or comment about today's topic or a suggestion for a future Healthy Connections webinar. 
Thanks again for joining us for How to Encourage Academic, Social, and Emotional Engagement of School-Age Children and Teens, A Survival Guide. Have a great day.